Hi everyone, this is your host Annie Zhang, and this is Hello Metaverse. Imagine a world before there was New York, Paris, Rome, or Hong Kong. At some point, these cities emerged from small settlements of people, to local communities, to international metropolises. Successfully creating a persistent world online is much the same as creating thriving communities and societies in the physical world. Rome wasn't built in a day. And similarly, online worlds do not just spawn into existence and become flooded with people and activity all of a sudden. Communication, infrastructure, the economy, and governing principles all need to be gradually built to sustainably support the needs of people being there. Today, I speak with Philip Rosdale, who is the creator of Second Life. For those of you who don't know, Second Life It was an online virtual world that took the world by storm in the 2000s. Second Life never intended to be a game or a social network really, but rather an organic world where any set of possibilities can happen. As a result, true life, culture, and societies organically formed and sustained there. Astoundingly enough, the platform still maintains about 1 million regular users who for lack of a better way to put it, live a second life there. If you do a quick Google search of second life, you'll encounter a rabbit hole of interesting phenomenon that the platform enabled. Stories of people who truly lived a double life and found themselves creating families with online strangers, to real countries establishing virtual embassies there. I explore with Philip what were those elements and factors that enabled such a unique occurrence to happen and why Second Life to this day is still one of the only platforms that successfully created such a realistic culture and society online. Beyond Second Life, Philip is still tackling the problem of how to bring people together online in the most natural way possible, but from a different perspective. He is now the co-founder of High Fidelity, currently exploring technologies that power 3D spatial spaces that help mimic the experience of being in crowds in real life. As a disclosure, all opinions and point of views in this podcast are my own. It does not represent the views of Roblox, my current employer, and is not affiliated with the company. And with that, here is my conversation with Philip Rosdale. You're often asked very lofty questions like, what is the metaverse? Or how do you create sustainable digital economies? But that's not where I want to start today. Where I want to start is just to ask about your most profound or interesting social experience in the virtual world. One of the first things that I did in 1994 was I started working on video compression. I did that because I knew that I couldn't build a virtual world, which is what I wanted to do. That is, I knew that the technology wasn't ready yet. But I, instead, I was interested in the question of whether you could send you know, even very grainy video over the internet, which was a novel thought because at that time we were mostly connecting over modems. And so uh, the bit rates were enormously lower than what we have today. And so I worked on compressing and sending video and audio over a website, basically, you know, I built a little app that you could download. It was called Freeview. And you can look it up in the Wayback Machine. I think it's a porn site today, so you don't want to look it up That's really uh, today, but Freeview was this application that I built with a friend of mine where you could, you didn't have to have somebody's phone number, you could just go on our website, so it was kind of an open public space kind of an idea, a lot like many of the things I worked on later. And you could just find a list of people that were running the app, and you could call them. And like one of the first groups that kind of discovered it and started using it were ham radio operators. Because ham radio operators, to them, the early internet with its ability to send a packet from one point to another was a lot like radio. And so they would make logs of all the people that they had contacted with Freeview. And if you may know, uh, ham radio operators often do that. You know, they make logs of all the people that they've reached in their sort of travels on the radio. <laughs> and so here, were, here was a new generation or here were the same people taking a new medium, this little downloadable video thingamajig that we had built but again there were there was no video stuff at the time this is 1994 1995 
and they were using it to call each other and to make logs of who they had called. How cool is that? That and, is, uh, you know, some of them hilarious. might call in their video, and they'd have their call tag, their ham radio call sign, which is like a gamer tag, right, or something old is new again. It was like a string of digits, and they'd have it like taped on uh, somewhere so that you could see it when you were talking to them. Really fascinating. It's, and they'd call it, me. It's fascinating when people are given a new piece of technology and they still try to work it back to their current ways of utilizing things. Like they weren't like, oh, I could use this in a fundamentally new way. They're like, okay, this is what I've been doing for a very long time. I'm going to do it better with this new piece of technology. Yeah, there is that phenomena where we use things through the frame of what we've known before. And then we figure out new ways to use the new things, I guess. But I, I thought that was really powerful. There was another time I called a guy who I think was a college student. I was just out of college myself. And he was in uh, Japan somewhere. And I remember at the time thinking, well, I may never go to Japan. I mean, it was conceivable mm -hmm. in the early 90s, you know, that such travel, such great distances, you know, you might not do. And I remember the light was coming in his room at a different angle, you mm -hmm. know, because it was a different right. time of day. Right. And he took a map and he drew on it where he was in Japan. And he held this map up for me to see. And it was so amazing. So that was a really profound moment. I, that seems to explain it today. It sounds so boring, right? But this was the early 1990s and I was using the internet and I was talking to this guy. That's incredible. Well, it's actually interesting that you mentioned that. And I want to talk a bit about where technology has essentially trended towards. You created Second Life in the early 2000s. And in many ways, it feels one of its kind. It's completely unique. It's actually a 3D virtual world that people are interacting with. But if you think about a lot of the other mainstream products out there that became really successful, whether it's MySpace, Facebook, you know, Instagram, now TikTok, it was very much driven by utility, right? Ability to chat, ability to share content. And that's where it sort of capped out. And so I'm curious to hear your perspective on why that was the case. And, you know, why was Second Life the only version of itself? There were a couple of things about Second Life that were quite different. One of them was, of course, the idea that you were there as an avatar. And at the time, that was a very new idea. And the fact that in Second Life, you could richly modify your avatar and that it could have a very rich, complex physical form to it was something that technically nobody had done. There were online video games like EverQuest and then World of Warcraft shortly thereafter, which became huge. But in those games, you wouldn't think of the character as an avatar, the way we use the word now. You would think of it instead as a playable creature, you know, that you ran around in that game with. And of course, Second Life was very different because it was you. And so this idea that you weren't just communicating, you weren't just sharing content, as you say, but you were also doing it as a person. That was something that was completely unique. And then another thing about Second Life was that it was a single vast space in which all creative building, all construction was done live. So you walked up to somebody and you literally saw them like pointing with their avatar's hand and like shaping the wall of a fort or something. And you'd walk up to them and say, what are you doing? You know, what are you building? And mm -hmm. I'd say, well, I'm building this thing. I'm building an exact model of the, you know, Chicago stadium uh, from the 1970s or something. It, it was crazy. So there was a sense of both identity and then creative expression that I still think hasn't been done. And you're right. In some sense, it was sort of left behind. And I've got lots of thoughts about why that was too. So what are your thoughts on why that combination has not been as prevalent in consumer products? I don't know exactly. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's like what Richard Feynman said about quantum mechanics. He said at one point in his career, he was not given to humility. He said, look, if you think you know what's going on down there in, qu in quantum mechanics, trust me, you don't. He said, I got a Nobel Prize. I don't know what's going on down there. <laughs> I'd say virtual worlds are kind of the same thing, you know. I've thought about them my whole life at this point, and I keep learning, and the amount of wondering that I do gets bigger over time, not less. But I would say there are some, a couple of things. One is that if you really are representing yourself as an avatar, if you're really creating you when you go into a virtual world, that is a choice that is very challenging and difficult and that not all of us are willing to make. Right. And I think this is still one of the rough roads ahead for virtual worlds because virtual worlds inevitably include you as the creature that's there. And I think 
that the people who came to Second Life and continue to come to it today are people who have made a choice to kind of devote most of their focus on their own identity to the avatar and not their real body. Wow. Which is an incredible, amazing thing, but not for everybody. Right. And so there's only a million or so people that are in Second Life. And most of the things that are really close to Second Life are also that scale. They're not huge. And look at something like Roblox as a wonderful example of kind of playing with that idea in a different way, for example, with kids. If you're changing your identity as a kid, that might be a little bit easier. You know, right. maybe you don't have one yet all the way, as we all can remember, right? When, you know, if you're 12 years old, you know what your identity is. Not you're, necessarily. you're wanting to explore. I think that's what you're trying to do. Yeah. And so I think wanting to explore your identity as a teenager is for everyone. And then as you get older, it's not. I, I would have thought earlier on that it would have been easier to have more than one me. Steven Spielberg saw Second Life at some point, and that was his line. He said, there are too many me's. <laughs> and I thought, that, I've always thought, that was, that's so great. What a clean, simple statement of the problem. That is fascinating. I, I never thought that was the truth. I always thought people were balancing multiple identities online, but it makes sense that you really only have so much emotional energy to pour into one life. I mean, anyone who's trying to have a double life is exhausting. You know, there was something amazing that we did in Second Life that I look back on now and I'm like, that that was really cool and different. We gave everybody last names. Oh, why did we do that? Well, one was we didn't want you to have to use a kind of a gamer tag. We didn't want Philip to have to be Philip, you know, you know, zero six five five or something. We w I wanted to just be Philip, and so I was trying to think as a designer about ways to make me just be Philip. And so I said, well, what if we had a number of last names, but each last name was like a family or a key or something like that, and you could only have so many people have the same last name. Then, or then if we had a sufficiently large number of made-up last names, I could type in my real first name, and the system could tell me, here are all the last names for which your first name is not presently taken. And so that was how we did it. But what we also did was we restricted the use of a given last name, but basically in the earliest days of Second Life, you got a last name like Omega. So you could be Philip Omega. Okay. And then we'd only give out that last name to like 150 people. Mm. Now, where'd the 150 come from? Of course, it was this famous number that you may know, which is called the Dunbar number. And the Dunbar number is a very rough estimate of the number of people that you can know well as a human, the capacity of our brain. Right. Is that we can only really emotionally understand, you know, empathically know like 150 people or so. And so I love that number so much that I said, that's what the number should be like. When you pick one of these last names, there can only be 150 people with your last name. And so if you meet one even years from now in the world and they share your name, you know, you're going to feel a connection. Did them. you feel that? Were there almost like tribe bonding because yes. of last names and like in search for your family and your ancestry and stuff like that? Exactly. People, oh. would, people would have gatherings. Also, the names dated themselves because the names would come into use and then be used up in a fairly short time window. So you also knew that mm. if you were an Omega or a Powers or whatever, you know, all these great names, those were the oldest names in the system. So, so, so you could date someone's avatar by their last name. Well, so taking a step back here, I really want to focus on how you figured out the fundamental building blocks of Second Life. You are a physicist by trade, and we've talked before about creating these laws of physics. What was that process like? What were the building blocks of... Well, the building blocks of Second Life in the very beginning were called prims. Well, in the very beginning, Second Life was a landscape that you could dig and raise. So you could push the land down and raise the land up, and we had kind of the usual tools for that. But what I always wanted was a kind of digital physics where there were atoms of some kind. And I, it, it seemed logical to me that the atoms would be something like platonic solids. You know, they'd be cubes and cylinders and whatnot. So that's what we did. We, we, we made a system where everything in Second Life, other than the land itself, curiously, everything else was basically built out of these little kind of Lego block-like primitives. And so, as you say, we built the physics of the system by starting with the capabilities of those very basic shapes. So they could have colors, they could have textures attached to different surfaces, a contentious design decision. 
they could have little blocks of scripting language attached to them that would allow them to do something like run away from you or, you know, change colors if you clicked on them or make a sound. So all of these were the basic capabilities that we imbued these digital atoms with. And then we tried to build a basic framework in which you could have a plot of land or whatever, and it could have tons of these things on it. And we tried to make that number as big as we could and make it so that, you know, these little bits of digital content could also be moved around. And then just like NFTs today, Mm -hmm. they had this thing called copy mod transfer that was CMT, as people said, and that was NFTs. So every little primitive in Second Life has the name of its creator, its current owner, and whether it can be copied, modified, or transferred, and then those same applications to the next owner. So every atom, imagine if the mo- every molecule of water <laughs> had the ability to be like sold as a, as a digital good. That, that's, that's what Second Life was. Yeah, I definitely want to revisit the whole NFT topic in a little bit later, but you talk a lot about these building blocks, like these physical building blocks, and it's very much governed by physics. Where did the culture start to evolve? Well, as I mentioned earlier, the fact that you had an avatar, which was in some ways a kind of an afterthought. Oh, was it? Yeah. Huh? And it, I often, well, I don't know how many people have heard this story, and maybe I'm telling it here for the first time, but... You know, in the very beginning of Second Life, the avatar was just the concept of almost an eye, like the eye of Sauron or the eye of God or something. You, hmm. you, you, the, the avatar was nothing more than a disc. You could tell where it was looking. So as somebody moved around in the world with their mouse and as they drove around with the arrow keys, you could see where they were and you could see where they were looking. And that, that basic idea of just knowing where people were and where they were looking was, was the first avatar in, in Second Life. And it was most helpful because if people were building things, which I mentioned, you know, you could kind of see them clustered around something and building ah. something. But the whole idea of an avatar having arms and legs and hair and stuff was something that came later. And so at some point we said, well, we really have to have bodies. <laughs> I mean, it just won't be fun or whatever, you know, like it won't be as, as visually meaningful. And so we added them. But yeah, we sort of started with the, the eye being, being just where you were and where you were looking. And at what point did it make sense for a real avatar to, to exist? Was there certain behaviors that you're seeing on the platform, certain types of interactions? Were users demanding for it? Well, I guess at the beginning, I always wanted something in which people could build stuff. I, I felt that we ought to be able to build the regular sorts of things that people might be interested in playing around in a digital space. So architectural structures, uh, scripted object like vehicles or toys or guns or things like that but then in answer to your question and in answer to the emergence of the early culture people began to really live there so you saw in their efforts a desire to establish a home and to have neighbors and to walk around and talk to their neighbors and so i think that idea of really actually living there in a pretty real life similar way was, was one of the first emergence uh, of culture. Um, did we precondition that by the very earliest artifacts being things that maybe looked like a town square or something? Maybe. But I think that people really wanted to rebuild the real world and kind of live in it there mm-hmm. with some modifications. Interesting. You're talking about people wanting to do basically what they're doing in real life, but kind of different in the online world. Why do you think that happens in the virtual world, in the metaverse? Technically, the possibilities are endless. You could do whatever you want, but yet people still go back to what's familiar. We know that the brain, more than anything else, is making predictions about the world. We know that the very act of consciousness is an awareness of what you think is going to happen next, that your brain is constantly kind of computing what happens next and then trying to fulfill it, basically. I think in a similar way, we value most and have the most comfort around the things that we can best predict. So the appearance of things, the behavior of things, we want things around us that are predictable. Our whole job is to kind of minimize error. Mm -hmm. They would say, that sounds terribly minimizing in itself, I think. And I always mean to say it not at all as a mechanic 
or as a computer scientist, but more as sort of a spiritual being, you know, I'm saying that that's okay. I think the very fact that we are constantly imagining the world outside us and trying to kind of imagine what happens next and be a part of it is very cool and fundamental. But it's also what makes people focus on the things they know and recreating the things they know and then tweaking them a little rather than kind of being conceptual artists and just going nuts. I, will, I was struck, I think, by the idea that it would, it would be this playground of recreation and imagination. But then I was really struck when Second Life, really hardcore people built Ferraris and not land speeders. That's <laughs> what I always said. You know, people built Ferraris. They didn't build the Starship Enterprise. But people build the things that they have the most tangible uh, real value to them. That's actually a really good segue to thinking about what this virtual world should be in in its future form for people. What is the ideal of the metaverse? And in many ways, we've spoken about this too. It feels like such a great playground to test different things, to try new things, try new identities, simulate different situations that you would never find yourself being in. And in some ways, it's going to be great for empathy. It's going to be great for just progression of learning and human consciousness but do you see that as a very unrealistic future of how people utilize these worlds if people are always gravitating to the familiar and maybe even simplifying their lives you know that idea of simplifying your life let me hold on to that while i think that in in certainly in some ways for example video games take something like grand theft auto right you have a visual presentation of los angeles that is almost uncannily accurate right mm -hmm. It's phenomenal, right? I mean, it's unbelievable. You know, they built from the coastline to the Central Valley in glowing, you know, almost perfect rendition. But then the only thing to do there is to kind of kill each other. And so that's terrible. I mean, I don't want to judge, but that's using virtual reality to simplify the world. And I, I agree with you. I don't think that's a good, a good thing. I, I think that there is a danger that if we simplify things, we make poor decisions based on those simplifications. But on the flip side, second life, if you go wander around in there, can be a lot more complicated than real life in a good way. Mm -hmm. I mean, in real life, you interact with a probably a pretty homogenous group of friends, right? I mean, if you live in a small town in the United States in real life, mm -hmm. you're encountering a pretty homogenous group of people who share views with you. If you go and try to start a business in second life, which hundreds of thousands of people have done, you're going to be encountering some real people that are going to be very different from you, you know, different age, different part of the world, po very possibly a different language. And you're going to be negotiating with them or befriending them or trying to figure things out with them. And I think that in a lot of cases, that's actually a little bit more complicated than real life. And that was one of the things that was and does continue to keep me excited about virtual worlds is that they can present us with both challenges that we wouldn't see in the real world that are learning challenges for us. And then second, of course, potentially a deeper connection with other people. I love that. And I want to ask you also about your philosophy around creating unpredictable outcomes. That was your whole ethos going into Second Life is how can I be a creator that cannot predict what on earth other people are going to do here? How do you think that was possible in Second Life? And what would you suggest for other platforms that are now evolving right. to embody that set of principles as well? I think the way it works is in a creative environment, there's a certain amount of capability that you need to add into the building tools to get over this magic hump where people are able to express themselves in, in their actions and in their creative work in this space. If you're on the, the short side of that hill, if you're not there yet, it really doesn't matter. You're never going to create a culture and a community and connections between people. If you can get over that hill, then you suddenly are into this space where people view the exercise of putting their own energy into the space as being a creative and self-expressive one. And it invites people to spend enough time to, to create really unpredictable outcomes. In certain games that do enable creativity or have rooms or whatever, it's like if you've seen one room after a point, you've seen them all, right? It's that feeling. Exactly. Like, you know, people have made kind of playground type experiences where it's like build your own or build your own roller coaster, build your own playground. That's super fun. But that's more like a game experience. You're never going to go in there and go, oh my God, I want to meet the person that made this. 
or you might do that just solely from a high score perspective or mm -hmm. something. But to really say, like, I am so interested in who built this house. You just have to have a certain level of capabilities in the in the in the tool set. What would you say was that threshold? It sounds like there's some element of needing to be in between the intersection of gaming as as well as social. You tend to see games that are overly gamified, social products that are overly simplified. Is it that intersection that is the magic moment? Look at Minecraft. Minecraft is fascinating. It doesn't allow you to be an avatar yet. So it, it does have that, like, you are all always alone in some sense. You know, you're not really yeah. there, like, with someone else. But it does allow building in a creative way that is feels pretty unfettered, right? Like, it really is interesting. People will build a working home computer or whatever, you know, entirely using Minecraft blocks and redstone wiring. So I think the answer probably is, there's probably more than one right answer. But what I think it was for Second Life was, it was something about, you could build some, you could build stuff that had a pretty open ended amount of interactivity like if you wanted to make a doorbell that i could click and it would send you a, a text message you know and say there's someone at your door it had to have a fairly strong range of programmability and then there had to be and this is where i would really strongly say i'm not sure mm -hmm. but it felt like with second life the fact that you could create things that were quite beautiful and lifelike like for example a finely made gold earring right. or a tattoo or something like that. It did seem like those things were critical in terms of getting, getting everybody kind of over the, over that the edge. Um, yeah. Interesting. So let's talk a little bit more about 3d and just like the medium of being in a 3d world. Second life was able to create that. A lot of places are not able to create that. There are also a lot of high fidelity worlds that people don't want to participate in. I mean, that kind of segues into the conversation about VR adoption and how it's not really as rampant as we expected it to be. So tell me about your thoughts on, on, on hardware or just the medium of 3d and what you think people want versus what do you think people don't actually need in their lives at this moment in time? Well, I think there's two big different things there that you just touched on. So let me separate them apart and then maybe we can take them on separately. There's 3D spaces and their appeal, you know, whether, whether explored with a VR headset or visually rendered. But then there's another thing which you touched on, which is like, why has VR adoption not been good enough yet? And I actually don't think that depends very much on 3D. Although the ability to experience 3D is, of course, the big pro of the VR headset. But the con of the VR headset, in my opinion, relates 100% to social interaction and to the space between people. The VR headset does not, as yet, enable us to feel like we're really there with other people. It does enable us to feel like we're visually experientially there or, or visually there i wouldn't even i would hesitate even to say experientially because we're also not embodied when we wear a vr headset we are not embodied in the space and i think that idea of being embodied is one that is you know kind of the subject of a great deal of science inquiry right now and it is poorly understood and it is very important and i think vr headsets actually we have to thank them we we can thank the vr industry for giving us a really rich look at embodiment even if the answers we got weren't what we want because the problem is it just doesn't feel right we're not really there yet and then uh, i mean you know in simpler ways the problem with the vr headset one you can't type you can't use your phone while you're wearing a headset you can't type at 40 words per minute that's a that's a deal breaker for people. So if you're wearing a VR headset, it's a toy. You're only in a space that you're going to be in for a very short period of time because you need to get back to being able to answer that text message on your phone. Also, the VR headset is uncomfortable, so we can't wear it for long enough to establish a real connection with someone new, for example. You can't have a 15-minute sampling at a time of a world containing real other people. It just wouldn't work. And then finally, and this is the one that really made me put my head in my hands in our own work at High Fidelity with respect to the VR headset, it's intensely divisive in terms of who's willing to use it. It's just, you know, men and women are not equally willing to wear a VR headset. Um, uh, the VR headset is a blinder. Um, when somebody puts a blindfold on in the real world with other people in the room, that's a pretty vulnerable thing to do. Like I always ask people, what's your favorite VR game? And I say to them, how was it the second time you used it? And they start <laughs> laughing, right? Because there wasn't one. Right. The thing they did, the thing, whatever it was, building something in rec room or whatever, they're like, 
that was the most life-changing experience. I put the headset on. You know, what we've all heard. Like, I, I had this incredible transcendental experience with VR headset on, and I never put it on again. Or I haven't put it on all COVID. And I'm like, I'm just people. Like, I am actually guilty of the same thing. Totally, right? Yeah. I haven't put on the VR headset. Well, so then where are we at right now? Now you're working on high fidelity, which pivoted really heavily towards sound. spatial audio and sound. Is that an intermediary towards the ultimate ideal that we're striving for? Or is it on that brink of being very utilitarian and something that's already within people's workflows that it just plugs into what they want? What do you make of it? Here's what I think we've learned so far. One, text communication was at the core of online from the very beginning, and it still is. It's kind of being rediscovered. Discord, most mm -hmm. recently, is causing us all to rediscover or re-examine the idea of like group text exchanges. Slack at work is making us think, wow, maybe text is all we need. In some sense, it is, right? Text is the most terse, beautiful in some ways language. We, em we embellish it with emojis. We use text and live translation to like caption everything and like translate between languages. I can talk to you. That is like super cool. So text works. It isn't uncanny in the sense of the uncanny valley. It's rich. It's powerful. Mm -hmm. Audio in its best moments is also not uncanny, right? I mean, we've all used it for years on just one-on-one -on -one phone calls. So audio has this magic property that as, as technology perhaps makes it a bit better as we do things like spatial, which is what we're doing with high fidelity, larger groups, which was very much actually our original goal with high fidelity. As, as we make audio work a bit better, maybe we're going to see some renaissance or, you know, some really interesting explosion of ideas around audio. There is something that feels very close about that. So I do think there's something there with audio. What I wonder about is what applications will emerge that really make audio like a group thing or a public thing or semi-public mm -hmm. thing or a hangout or whatever. I don't think we know that quite yet. And it's also this weird synthetic thing where you're like getting some of your sensory experiences and then not others. I, I think you mentioned somewhere and we've worked a lot at Roblox about this too, is when you're on spatial audio, you are very comfortable expressing yourself because you can't nobody can see your face nobody can see your actual identity visually but yet like your sonic identity is there and i i think it really shifts the dynamic of social relationships but i, I don't know qu quite what it means you never have seen that dynamic anywhere else we really haven't i no. mean it, it's a giant group telephone call you know as a as a funny side note one of the fathers of virtual reality jaron lanier who is this amazing, amazing genius uh, who's been working in and around VR ideas his, his whole career now. He says that when he was a kid, they had this mishap or defect or something with the local phone system. This is in New Mexico, where all the kids knew that on like Tuesday night at 10 or whatever, if you picked up the phone, you were all on this big party line. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> And he said that his aspirations about VR were largely shaped by that, that he was in this floating giant space where there was only audio with a whole bunch of people late at night with other kids. His whole thing was like, we got to make this work. So I think that audio is disarming in the same way that text is. But as you said, it's also strange because you don't have the faculties of your other senses to engage as well. By the way, there's a Yale study, which is so topical to this, that everybody's been talking about. It came out a few months ago. And it was a study where Yale looked at voice communication versus video communication and the combination of the two. And one of the things they did was they had people talk to each other face-to-face -face in a room, sitting and having a conversation, pairs of people that didn't know each other. And the, ver the variation that the researchers made were for some of the groups, they turned off the lights in the room. And what they studied was whether you understood each other. They, they post-interviewed people to basically said, did you understand that where that person was coming from? Did you have an empathic understanding of that person? And curiously enough, they found was that audio only improved empathic communication, contrary to what a lot of us say. A lot of us would say that body language is very important. And of course, it certainly is in many ways. But still, I think for most of us, if we focus only, if, you know, if we close our eyes, we only focus on listening, we actually do hear more. 
I really so believe that even the difference between doing a Zoom interview and doing in-person interview, you can't compare doing in-person versus Zoom. But what I do find is I'm so immersed in the audio recording of it that I can actually hear my thoughts and process thoughts faster. There's so much more to process when I'm seeing your face. Sometimes it can even be conflicting signals as well. And there's an argument with Zoom and a, a, there, there's an argument that a big part of Zoom fatigue, as we all call it, is that. In the, in the specific case of Zoom, you're seeing a visual representation of someone that's not quite right. They're not looking at you. They're not looking where you think they think, you're, think they're looking. <laughs> and what happens is you have to use some of that scarce brain to understand what's going on. And that, that the cost of understanding is that you're not really listening. Basically trying to compute all those angles. You know, who is she looking at that I, that I can't see? Is, is she looking at a book or at her phone? Or <laughs> it's just all this stuff's going on. And it takes up a big bunch of your your brain's processing time. And usually the answer is yes, she is not looking at right. you and she does not care about what right. you're doing. <laughs> and partial attention, right? Are we nicer to each other when we pay better attention? Of course we are. There's some interesting nuggets that we just talked through. One is this idea of this like party line. It feels like every successful social product out there really has to create the sense of togetherness. There's something happening. There's hype. And then there's also something that I want to get to, which is artificial intelligence and its role in creating virtual worlds. We're trying to piece these two things together. Do you think there's a world where AI can fulfill the need for a creation of liveliness, a creation of culture, or feeling like there is a congregation of something so that maybe when real people are not there to hang out, there are NPCs that you can interact with. You've been asking these great questions. First of all, can we use AIs to like build forests and trees and wonderlands and stuff to play in? Yeah, totally. I mean, there's so much good work going on on that. My, my son is doing work in virtual art using mm. AI to... Um, look at tens of thousands of paintings and then paint new paintings, which is something that is going on quite a bit. That is to say, AIs are easily now able to paint new paintings that are better than the other ones. I mean, they're just it's just incredible. So AIs can be used to do things like dream up forests. So I think that if we want to have a big forest scene where you're playing a shooter game and you're running around chasing each other in a forest, that's going to be AI generated. And it's going to be crazy. And maybe... Every time you play the game, it's a new forest the size of Yosemite, <laughs> right? Right. That's going to be shock and awe, you know, when yeah. we're able to see. And I think we're there. Like, we'll see games like that come out in the next couple of years. I'm, that's just one thing. I think you asked the question, can AI, like, make a space lively? I think the answer is no. I think people Aww. make a space lively. But then there's the question, are the AIs going to be sentient? You know, are they going to be things like us? I think her is the best look because it's optimistic, too. But it's also a very, I think, likely look at where we go next. And what I mean is it's going to be possible to be a lot smarter, more artistic, more fantastic, more funny or whatever than us. Like it or not, we only have so many brain cells. And unless you harbor some increasingly irrational belief about magic being in those brain cells and instead believe, like most of us, that there is a beautiful emergent uh, thing that is us that happens on top of a hundred billion nerve cells and a hundred trillion synaptic connections. If you if you believe that latter more common belief, then it's inevitable that we're going to build computing systems we already have right that have that size and scale compared to our brains, and those systems are very likely to be able to do things like entertain us and talk to us and stuff. But kind of like the film Her, I don't think they're going to stop there. In other words, right. I mean, I think that there's going to be a more interesting future around AIs that maybe possibly where we're not even the major part of that show, us humans, you exactly. know? Exactly. And are those AIs going to, as in her, are they going to hang around and entertain us? I don't <laughs> think so. Not beyond a point. I mean, why would they? So I feel like there's this instability where we're all imagining these like unlikely or very brief moments where like we're hanging out with the AIs and their whole job is to keep us happy. But I think those things are probably not futures that we're going to live in for very long. And of course, some of those futures are very dangerous futures. Well, so you mentioned crypto, so we definitely have to talk about that. <laughs> you are pretty much one of the fathers of digital currency and online economies. And you recently tweeted about how Second Life had the first ever NFT. Tell me about what you think right now the hype is trying to capture and what are people missing out on what is truly valuable? Now, that's another one of those seven-part mm. questions you just <laughs> asked there. But um, part of the hype around cryptocurrencies is it's a hustle. You know, if there's this hype factor or there's this 
rich get richer problem, you know, where as soon as you start pushing that stock up beyond a point, it's just going into silly land. So the ICOs, the multiple cryptocurrencies at the very beginning, 2009 on, uh, the ICOs of 2016 and the NFTs of 2021 are the latest to some, in some ways, hype machine and bubble around, uh, you know, hustling people. So I think that's one dark little piece of it. NFTs as, as, as it applies to art is fascinating. I mean, the, the idea that you could make artistic property more durable and more transferable is super cool. And when I say that that was what we did in Second Life, yeah, totally. One of the big drivers in Second Life was that every primitive had this concept of copy, modify, transfer, where you could check those three check boxes and you could check them for the next owner of the thing. And, and anything from a tree in your yard to a motorcycle to headphones you were wearing on your avatar, they could all be uh, moved around that way. And that idea that you could mark something permanently with who made it and you could transfer it to other people and you could set these little flags, super cool. I mean, definitely an example of using digital capabilities to create something genuinely new. So in that sense, I'm very excited about things like NFTs, but the problem is the first movement of that opera is one where there's just a lot of people hustling each other for the most part numerically. My last question to you is around the metaverse and around this recent trend of being obsessed with the metaverse once again. I think you've been around for long enough that this trend has come up a couple of times. One is why do you think people keep on wanting to seek this out? And then the second is what typically causes that surge of interest in certain peaks of times through technological development? The metaverse becomes less clear to me the older I get, which I love. <laughs> over and over, we have this desire to, 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 find, to find the metaverse. I think the core desire comes from the idea of a place where we can be together. Everybody's fascinated by that, right? Like, might there not be other places? What about Mars? What about, mm. uh, what about other places where we can be together, meaning communicate, live, or meet new people, whatever? And so there's this persistent idea that that, that there's got to be a way to do that better, a way to fold space so that we don't have to travel to the other side of the world to meet new mm -hmm. people, right? That certainly drives the big idea of it. Then I think just below the really aspirational idea, there's like all the brands and companies saying, there's got to be a way to make money. There's got to be some sort of a metaverse <laughs> that's like a gigantic shopping mall. And there's all the people are in the shopping mall. Do we all want to live in a gigantic shopping mall? Uh, no, thank you. And I'm not an investor, but I can't tell you how many slide decks I've rifled through that are literally... We all want to live in a giant shopping mall and here's how that shopping mall is going to work and monetize and everything. And I'm just like, wait a second, there's a fundamental assertion here. <laughs> Similarly, I think the idea that we all want to live in the same video game, that isn't true either. You know, Ready Player One, what a tragedy, wonderful book. And then the film came out and the film said, we're all going to live in a giant coin collecting, fast running video game. Totally false, not consistent with the book, and not appealing. I really like that perspective. I think that trying to figure out what this massive metaverse is where all of the games and all of the platforms are going to be interoperable and they're going to talk to each other and you can magically jump from one to one, that definitely feels a little bit out there. I, I like your point about having optionality and being able to go to Second Life one day and then maybe being able to go just do stuff on TikTok and then go to Fortnite and, and all of that. So... There is something yeah. beautiful about separation rather than trying to create some huge conglomerate. Well put. I, I would always say <laughs> this, the, the stitched together, portaled together sum of all video games is less than the parts. And even on top of that, and going back to the beginning, solving for communication. I think if you can take two random people that don't know each other, put them in the equipment, and stick them in your proposed metaverse, if they're like, hey, I really connected with that person, now, now you've got something. Nothing else matters, but we're not to that point yet. Thank you so much for all of your insights. It's always wonderful talking to you. Thanks for having me. That was Philip Rosdale. You can find him on Twitter at Philip Rosdale, and you can still try out Second Life by creating an account on secondlife.com. You can also try out his current work at High Fidelity on Spatial Audio Technology via the Clubhouse app, which has enabled spatial audio in all chat rooms. If you like this episode, feel free to hit the subscribe button on your podcast streaming app of choice and leave a review. If you have feedback or ideas for topics or guests to bring onto the show, please email me at annie at hellometaverse.fm. Thank you for listening. 
This is your host, Annie Zhang, and I will see you next week.